We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So I'd like to thank all the speakers for an amazing collection of talks. I've covered a lot of ground. I'm sure there is a lot of questions. The idea for the next one hour, we have until five o'clock, is to um, ask a selected subset of questions to um, most of our speakers. And I will start out, we will take turn, my co-chair Alyssa Crittenden and I will take turn in asking questions. Given that she gave the first presentation, I will start out with a question for, from Jeremy, who's asking about weaning foods. We heard about this important step from breast milk that is uh, consumed, that was over the last 200,000 years consumed uh, for more than the first two years of life. So the question is, what did our foremothers traditionally use as weaning foods? And how important were the different ecosystems? If you compare honey as a weaning food to seal blubber as a weaning food in the Arctic. Uh, what do you think is the impact of ecology in all these different ecosystems that our species has uh, inhabited? Um, I'm happy. So thank you, Pascal, for fielding that question. Um, I think that ecology is incredibly important. But while weaning foods may vary both now in settings as well as in the, the characteristics of weaning are the same. So things like, um, so they had to be foods that infants could eat with immature digestive systems and immature dentition. So you do have foods, um, the population who I work with, the Hadza, they often use honey or they use pre-masticated meat or broth as a weaning food. Uh, blubber has been suggested as a weaning food around the world. So the, the answer is that there was no one weaning food is that first of all, weaning is a process. So when you start introducing these foods over time, um, infants are often still breastfeeding. So they're foods that infants have to be able to consume um, without teeth. Um, so that, that's kind of the short answer for that question. But yes, ecology is very important, but no matter where you live, you can find weaning foods for an infant. Thank you very much. And I pass on to you for the next question. Oh, Kristen, go uh, ahead. I was gonna add to what please, you said. Please. please underline uh, one of the things you listed, which is that so often we see, and you and I have both seen this among the Hadza, pre-masticated almost anything. Uh, there was a long time when people thought you had to have, or you needed agriculture, for example. There are certain kinds of things that will be associated with weaning age because you need to be able to prepare a certain kind of forage or something like that. And really the data are very inconsistent with that as people who have put them all together, Dan Sellen and, uh, and uh, Smey. Uh, and, and then it is the case that uh, people pre-masticate whatever is being eaten. And um, as, as Sarah Hurdy has said, kiss feed infants who um, uh, certainly appreciate that. So the notion that there will be some constraint of local ecology seems Although I think ecology always matters, but I think maybe not in the ways we once thought. 
Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Kristen. I'm going to let Ian jump in, but I will. I will just uh, say in in Sarah's book, Mothers and Others, when she talks about kiss feeding, she actually lists an example um, where I that I shared with her about children, about older children, not to feed to infants. So the other is it's not moms who are necessarily giving the weaning foods. It's also, especially with pre-masticated foods, that kiss feeding can be any number of owl mothers. Ian, I'm gonna let you pop in and answer and then we're gonna to pivot to another question. Excellent. It, it seems to me that there are some really serious implications of this hypothesis. The first is that there should be very different demography, very different um, ages, lengths of time between births. Um, between hunter-gatherers on the one hand and farmers on the other. And secondly, there should be very serious demographic uh, differences between uh, pre-lactose uh, intolerance and, and uh, post-lactose intolerance. Um, is that the right way around? I always get it wrong. Um, farmers. Um, so has anybody surveyed the demography of these uh, basically three different groups? Maybe I, I would just jump in and say, um, that's what I was just talking about, that when you look at weaning age across populations that have very different uh, kinds of subsistence systems that you don't see the expected association between, again, things like grains to make porridge and so on and, and uh, weaning age. But it would be the case for archeological examples though, wouldn't it? I would say the evidence of living people would be against expecting that to have been the case in the archaeological past. Right. But Ian, at least in North America, many hunter-gatherers and farmers have no difference. It would support what Kristen is saying, where we right. have really good uh, skeletal representation so that you could begin to look at this issue. We don't see a difference. Okay, so, so where does the selective advantage for lactase persistence come from? For, for lactase persistence? Well, for whatever it is, but for, for being continuing, continuing to be able to process milk. But that isn't necessarily having to do with weaning. That would have to do with having a product that you could eat for longer periods of time. So that would be adults and offspring. I don't know that it's okay. very to okay. weaning in any way. Thank you, Margaret. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to pivot. And I do, I do just think that one of the things um, also that we can say is that the archaeological evidence, if you use stable isotope analysis to look at weaning, depending on how you choose to measure that, even if you look at the eruption of M1, as kind of the cessation of weaning, it tends to actually map on regardless of subsistence pattern to what Kristen's saying. So you actually okay. see a nice kind of confluence here um, of what the data are telling us about weaning is it tends good. to be, yeah, so that's I'll good. I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question um, for Barry Bogan who gave the talk right after me. Barry, this is coming from one of our CARTA students, Linnea. How much of childhood or what it means to be a child do you think is culturally determined versus purely biological? Thanks very much for the question. Um, funny thing, I was just writing about that today because uh, Pascal reminded me to prepare some notes for our meeting um, tomorrow about the uh, matrix of comparative anthropology. Um, we have to be very careful when using language because language of course is cultural. So even the word child or childhood is loaded with meanings. And we often call anyone under 18 years of age, sometimes under 21 years of age, uh, a child um, in a legal sense. My definition of childhood is based on biology. It's based on uh, the patterns of physical growth in uh, height and weight and body composition, uh, bone, muscle. It's based on um, brain development. It's based on a lot of other factors that we can measure quite precisely in centimeters 
or uh, cubic centimeters or whatever uh, units we're using. Uh, it's not based on um, it's not based on cultural attitudes. So childhood for me is universally found in our species and it's not found in chimpanzees or any ape species uh, based on those kinds of physical measurements that I'm talking about. Uh, historians, social historians of childhood have argued uh, that childhood is an invention of um, perhaps the 18th or 19th or even 20th century. I don't think so. I think childhood goes back to at least the beginning of our own species and probably, as I said in my talk, probably uh, much further back, uh, perhaps the Homo erectus. Thank you, Barry. Thanks very much. I'll take the next question, which is from Maria, and it's directed to Kristen Hawkes. Uh, and the question is the following. Uh, is the apathy of children in orphanages due possibly to the lack of adults to respond to their seeking of nurturing responses? As you describe these expert socialites, the human babies? Yes, those, those flirtatious babies. Uh, well, I don't, Maria, I don't know is it Marie or Maria? Um, you may know way more about this than I do, but yes, the, the examples of the Romanian orphanages and the sort of disastrous consequences there have been associated with the fact that there was, here are kids who are just in cribs and have no interaction. And there have been really interesting uh, sort of parallel, uh, if that's what they are, experiments with captive chimpanzees and the difference between um, rearing uh, contexts in which there's a lot of interaction with others. Uh, Tessero is the one who really ought to, ought to speak to this. Um, but absolutely, this seems to be, and I've gotten more and more interested in the ways we characterize that, that early period in childhood, so much of our evidence about that comes from a very narrow, very narrow range of, 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 of us. Uh, and, and it's mostly very middle class, usually the children of academics who will bring them to the Yale baby lab. And, and there's way more range of variation in the kinds of things that infants experience. And there certainly are people who talk about patterns of attachment in context in which there isn't very much face-to-face -face between infants and others, but there's a lot of skin to skin. And so I think there is a lot of variation in how babies are interacting with others, but uh, to the extent I understand what people who study this closely have been finding, it is so characteristic of us, this active uh, uh, attempt to try to figure out how to be on the same page with others. And, and so language is certainly then, maybe I should turn to Robert, certainly associated with that. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll ask the next question. Um, Linda Marchant, this is for you, Linda. One of our participants, one of our webinar participants, EJ, is asking you to please comment on consciousness in apes, especially Pan. Wow. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think we can we can clearly uh, agree that they are conscious. But are we talking about self recognition? Are we talking about the? I'm trying to deal with this light here. Are we talking about their ability to think about themselves? Um, so I, I'm wondering about if you could get more from the question, or if there's more in the in the the, the text of the question. But but I'll I'll go on a bit. Um, whether it's Pan Paniscus or or Pan Troglodytes, um, we've got you know cognitive evidence for that genus that that looks at um, self recognition, looks at imitation, gives us good evidence for theory of mind. So if, if all of those cognitive attributes talk about the capacity to be conscious and to know oneself as opposed to other, other individuals in your life, then, then I think that's a, that's a clear line of evidence that, yeah, chimpanzees and bonobos know who they are and they know their conspecifics. I, I hope that helps. It does, thank you. You're welcome. 
I'll uh, take the next question. This is a question from Eve for Margaret Scherninger. And the question is the following. What came first, our incidental inclusion of bone marrow into the diet, thereby setting the stage for brain growth, or an unusual evolutionary drive to feed brain growth by zeroing in on a highest ratio of nutrients to energy expended? Excellent question, Eve. I, I hate to start answers that way, but in this case, it is excellent because it goes exactly to the point that I was trying to make in the beginning. Do we have evidence for selection on the brain itself and brain growth? Or as Robert Martin has long argued that a female will grow the largest brained infant that she can given body size constraints and those kinds of things. Um, and I guess I have always been persuaded by Bob Martin's argument that as you begin to feed a larger brained infant, the brain will grow. I, and I based that largely on this uh, graph that I showed, which does not show a giant stop, uh, jump in brain size. Now we could turn around and find out later if they fill in the blanks that we really do have a jump in brain size. And if we do, then everything I'm saying is wrong. But <laughs> at least the evidence as of now would suggest that there is a rather gradual increase in brain size. If you remove the megadons, that it's hard to even understand. We call them cousins, but I have a feeling they're pretty Unre very distantly related cousins. If we remove them from that graph, you still see a very strong correlation, uh, brain size um, increase over time, but it's not a jump in brain size. The, the common one that we often see is that it's a plateau and then a jump. And that's just not based on the data that we actually have. So does that answer your question? I don't think it answers your question. I think what it says is the data right now do not support the fact that the brain increased in size in, in uh, bits and starts. That it was probably a long gradual increase. And that to me suggests something to do with the diet changing that allowed mothers to give birth to larger brain infants constraints of body size rec recognized and constraints of body uh, biomechanics un understood. Thank you very much, Margaret. Back to Alyssa. Okay, the next question is a language question for Robert. Um, coming from Raphael, one of our webinar participants. What is the evidence that Homo ergaster or any early ancestor may have produced finger or body pointing. So what would be the most tenable hypothesis regarding how old declarative pointing might be based on the evidence? Ooh, um, <laughs> it's hard, of course. Oh, am I unmuted? Yeah, I am. It's hard to know exactly what the behavioral repertoire was of no longer existing hominin species. So um, maybe you know some of my anthropological colleagues could answer that one based on some sort of evidence that I'm not familiar with. I mean, people have, you know, made valiant attempts to reconstruct um, behavioral repertoires relative to language on the basis of fossil evidence. And every time it's basically bit, bitten the dust, um, unfortunately. And some of, the, some of the proposals were quite promising, but um, it always turns out to be a disappointment, at least so far, um, there's always hope. Um, in terms of pointing, um, I mean, there are, you know, as I said very briefly um, and showed those slides, um, there, in captive apes, there's some evidence that there's not pointing per se, not like with the finger, but the, there are these indexical gestures to other um, apes in the, the same environment. Um, and then there's also uh, evidence uh, from the wild that um, chimpanzee infants, and I'm not going to remember the researcher here, Tetsuro may know who it is. Um, this is a, um, I don't remember who it is. Um, but that chimpanzee infants who actually beg for food, and that includes um, gesturing by putting like a hand to the mouth of the person who's eating, 
um, is kind of, you know, as I tell my undergraduates, the, the, the phenomenon of being in a restaurant and, you know, you're, the, pre the people you're with don't order dessert, but you do, and then they look at your dessert and go, wow, that looks really good. Um, it's the, sort of the chimp equivalent of that. Those um, chimps, uh, infants that beg for food, they actually get fed more. So there's survival advantage to using gestures in that kind of indexical way. So I've always felt that um, given that um, chimpanzees uh, gesture um, and other apes gesture that probably um, earlier hominin species gestured as well. But you know, I, I don't know that we have any concrete evidence of that. Could, could, could I add one thing to that, Robert? Please do. Okay. Um, there's a wonderful research group at the University of St. Andrews, and I think it's called the St. Andrews Ape Gesture Consortium or something like this, but it's Dick Byrne and lots of his colleagues. And what they've been able to show is this really highly conserved gestural repertoire in gorillas and chimpanzees. Um, they use the word innate or they use another word, um, but the point is that these apes start out when they're younger with a very large gestural repertoire, which just seems to be available to them. And then they basically shrink it down as they get older. But those gestures are there um, from the get-go. And so there's beautiful ethograms. But what these apes also do is that they can use, they can choose amongst what's available to them and they can target um, recipients and they can also modify the gesture or enhance it depending on whether they're getting back from the target what they need. So I, I think you're right. There's just a lot of, there's a good reason to argue that gesture is available in, in the hominoid lineage. And there's every reason to think that early hominins would have had gesture available to them. This is just a kind of conservative argument. That's all uh, I got. Can I leap in there? Leap, Ian, leap. <laughs> Um, sorry, can, can I just say something there? I mean, we, we looked at this about 25 years ago, and uh, there was a story that I think originated with Sue Savage Rumba that Kanzi traveling with Matata pointed. But Kanzi was on Matata's back, and so Matata never saw the point that Kanzi made, and therefore the point was not reinforced. Now, I don't know whether that's still the way people look at primate uh, gesture, but it seemed to us to reinforce the point that we were making, which is that early hominins at some stage must have of necessity because they were walking bipedally and upright and without basically hair on their bodies, must have carried their infants in front of them so that the parent would have seen or the caregiver would have seen any gesture that was made before the eyes of the caregiver. And therefore, the gesture might have been reinforced. Now, I don't know whether that has held up over 25 years, but it seemed to me a very strong argument. Very good point. Uh, I go to the next question, which is directed to Tetsuro Matsuzawa by Martin. And the question is, is there any evidence of a young chimpanzee who has learned a task by observing its mother that this, that this young chimpanzee transmits this knowledge to another untrained young chimpanzee? Mm. Well, uh, in my talk, uh, I showed the laboratory simulation of education by master apprenticeship. So this is a purely experimental setting. Uh, and I did nothing except teaching the mothers. So the mother did the right thing in front of the infant chimpanzees and the infant chimpanzee uh, imitated in that case matching to sample cognitive task using the computer and getting the reward, um, a coin, and put the coin into the vending machine to get the reward. So the entire process, I'm not involved. Uh, only the mothers show the good model. And the infant has an intrinsic strong motivation to make a copy of the mother. And the mother showed the high tolerance to the infant so that is exactly the same to the case of stone tool use in the wild. So that is my point I wanted to communicate with you. Thank you very much. Elisa, back to you. 
I have a question um, for Nina Jablonski. Nina, this is coming from one of our um, webinar participants. Why do humans still have residual hair on parts of our body, specifically on the top of our heads and on our face when we have lost it elsewhere? It's a good and frequently asked question. Um, the short answer is that we kept hair on our heads, uh, at least as young uh, human individuals, most of us have hair on our heads, uh, almost certainly for thermoregulatory reasons. In the bipedal posture, we get direct solar radiation on the tops of our heads. And during uh, or when we live at the equator or in the tropics, uh, that direct solar radiation on the top of our heads uh, actually places a lot of direct heat load on the surface of the cranium. The interesting thing is that hair in any form does protect the surface of the head from overheating, but tightly curly hair seems to be exceptionally good at providing a sort of a thermal buffer and also by allowing sweat to, uh, to evaporate uh, in, in a barrier layer of air. So uh, my dissertation, my PhD student, Tina Lassisi, is currently finishing a, a dissertation on this very topic on the evolution of hair texture. And she has done this interesting series of simulations showing that, uh, and Barry, you'll be happy to know she did this at Loughborough University in the ergonomics lab, uh, <laughs> that thermal mannequins with wigs wearing tightly curly hair were able to maintain cooler scalp temperatures than those with, with longer straight hair, making at least a, a theoretical argument then not only for the retention of hair, but for the evolution of tightly curled hair on the head. The presence of pubic and armpit hair <clears throat> is, is harder to explain. But in those regions, we have a high concentration of apocrine glands that, have, uh, that, that secrete a series of odorant molecules, some of which have been established to be true pheromones in humans. And so to me, the most cogent hypothesis, certainly not proven, but suggestive is that is that we have retained hair in those regions to help transmit these odorant molecules into the atmosphere so that other, uh, other people in our group can smell them. So although in modern societies, we spend an inordinate amount of money and energy trying to get rid of these smells, they may be actually very important and could be the origins or the part of the explanation for why we have retained uh, hair in those areas. And lastly, uh, the tiny hairs that we retain on the surface of our body are still there, and they are really essential for maintaining the integrity of wound healing on the surface of the body because they're, uh, the, the hair follicles uh, and the, the sweat gland follicles are actually the niches for stem cells in the epidermis that are essential for repairing the skin. Could I ask a, a follow-up on, on that? Love um, it. Yes, actually, please. Because so, um, this is something I've been interested in for a long time. You know, humans have a, a whole variety of, of body hair types. You mentioned, you know, axillary hair and uh, head hair and and pubic hair, but there's also facial hair. Yes. Um, and do do apes have the? I mean, these all differ in 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 texture, and I assume in other ways as well. Do apes have that kind of diversity of body hair types, or is that? Um, just they all over their bodies they have the same kind of hair as we have on our heads so these the hair on our heads are terminal hairs as opposed to the vellus the very very fine hairs that we have on our body um, chimps 
and other apes and other catarine primates for that matter have hairs that are of different length in different parts of the body and sometimes different colors. Chimps and gorillas notably uh, age and their hair becomes thinner and in, especially in gorillas it turns conspicuously white uh, in particular regions of the body as the animals age. So the, uh, the structure of ape hair, terminal hairs, is very, very conservative in humans and in chimpanzees and gorillas. Uh, but we have basically retained just those terminal hairs on the top of the head. Thank you very much. I'll, I move to the next question, which is for Arnie Patel. Um, this is from Tom, who wonders if the rhythms of long distance running during the hunt might have helped develop musicality among early humans. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I mean, the idea that rhythm is tied to some sort of, our sense of musical rhythm is somehow tied to our, something about our physical bodies. Um, the, you know, the rhythms of walking or gait or running, the rhythm of the heartbeat. Um, these are old and very appealing ideas. Uh, the problem with those ideas is that, uh, of course, many animals run and many animals, of course, many animals walk. Um, and we don't see this sense of uh, beat, um, the ability to entrain movements to a beat being that widespread. So it's really important to distinguish producing a rhythm, like chimpanzees are known to drum, for example. They drum on tree buttresses as part of displays. Um, so they can produce really beautiful kind of musical periodic rhythms, but what we don't see them doing that comes so naturally to humans is in training their own physical movements when they hear those rhythms, those, those uh, beat-based rhythms. So, um, so whether or not running and bipedalism has some connection to our sense of beat is an interesting and open question right now, but it's one that uh, would have to face some of these challenges about why then other animals that run uh, don't necessarily have the sense of rhythm that we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question from Jason, who's from one of our participants. Um, and this question is, are there discern, this is for Todd. Um, are there discernible differences in the EEG signatures of humans, chimpanzees, and macaques? And can they be used to predict differences between species? That's, that's a really good question, and um, I don't know the answer to that. This is something I looked into years ago um, when people were doing scalp recordings of, of different um, primate species, and what you could see were changes that were correlated with, um, with brain development, with, with um, you know, with the general pattern of of life history. But um, to my knowledge, there aren't really um, obvious differences. So for example, if you, you can find event-related potentials um, associated with, with particular tasks, which you can give to humans and monkeys. Um, so I think, you know, perhaps this is an, an area that's been understudied but uh, I don't think that there's a whole lot there in the current literature that's very informative about differences. And mostly it looks like similarities, at least the last time I checked that literature. Thank you. Thanks very much. The next question is directed to Ian Davidson, and it's by one of our anthropogeny specialization students, uh, James Michelow. His question is, are language and or the cognitive prerequisite of language necessary for art? I presume art three. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say absolutely. Um, and um, we may have some slight differences on what constitutes language, but I found myself in substantial agreement with um, uh, Robert uh, about this, um, I think. Um, and you would have noticed that in my screen about uh, about how you get to art uh, towards the end of my talk. Um, I went through the semiotic stages that Robert mentioned in his talk. And I, I think that the, the one of the, I mean, 
I have, I have some difficulty writing a thing for Mocha about art because art is different things to different people. And um, the, as I point out in, in my talk, art three, um, the early stages that lead to art must be necessarily very different from what constituted art from the 18th century onwards in, West, in Western Europe and the United States. Um, and, but some people would say that art was only what you see in the galleries of, of the Western world. So it all depends what you mean by art, it all depends what you mean by language. Um, but at very least, I think that a definition of art which would follow the Oxford Dictionary or would follow the definition that I use would require um, some development of concepts that can come only from the sorts of criteria that Robert Kluwer mentioned in his talk, um, arbitrariness, um, uh, displacement, and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Julia, another one of our CARTA students, and this is for you, Kristen. Um, and I'm, I have a feeling that a couple of people may want to jump in on this one, uh, myself included, but. You, you get the floor first. And this question is, given the fact that in our society, most women work for decades past the onset of menopause, and there's no federal or statewide support of families such as subsidized childcare in the US, and about one fourth of women in the US continue working a mere two weeks after having given birth, how will decreased attention and commitment to our children and mothers impact the future of our society? Oh, two seconds or less. <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> no. oh, oh, Julia, what a what what a question, huh? And and look what the current situation with uh, everybody at home is is revealing, really, about what that means for for families. Uh, I think I said that I, I I now see that this picture we have of just mom, dad, and the kids uh, with a picket fence around them. That's a very narrow uh, strip of what is um, characteristic of even weird societies, if you, if you know that, that acronym, uh, because there are all kinds of places where people are living in multiple uh, generation households and therefore in even more worried about um, the COVID problems and when people have to go to work because they don't have any support, the recognition, uh, you know, maybe I should turn this back to Alyssa, of how much uh, people are dependent on others for so many aspects of what's going on with their kids, which we for the most part, have have been ignoring and and seeing that all revealed, and uh, absolutely, I think the, the the current even discussion about um, school age kids and that's become a kind of technical term in developmental psychology where they think about children as preschool, right? So thinking about school as just how it's always been for this animal, uh, where there are developmental psychologists who've talked about what goes on outside of school has always been a huge part of how children learn about the world around them and their social interaction with others. So, uh, I, I, you know, it, it's, we're having a lot of trouble agreeing about how we think about the past the future, wow, uh, so many things to be scared about. So I will pass the baton to anyone else who wants to, um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Say oh. optimistic. Oh, optimistic, oh dear. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have unmuted myself so quickly. Um, well, I, I have two thoughts and then we can pivot back to uh, Pascal for another question. Um, the first thing I will say is I really appreciate you saying that, Kristen, because I think that one of the most significant impacts, myself as, as a parent, as a working parent who also has a young child, um, I'm reminded daily how much we rely on others. And I'm reminded daily that <laughs> the concept of a nuclear family and parents raising their kids in isolation is not only, this, this, this has no deep evolutionary roots, to your point the whole adage, it takes a village to raise a child. Th 
this, this really is one of the hallmarks of our species. And, and I think no time um, has made that more apparent than right now in, in with pandemic parenting and working. Um, I will also say, I would like to also give, give a shout out to, to Margaret, to my former advisor, Margaret Schoeniger, because I think that we also tend to forget how undervalued women's labor in general has been. Um, both in terms of the evolutionary uh, modeling and literature and also right now, we, we tend to forget that moms have always been juggling this dual role of, of, that we're dealing with. So um, I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything, jump in on this. Well, I would just underline that, that, that primate moms are working moms. It is characteristic of the whole bloody order. So <laughs> let us remember that. Thanks very much. Uh, I have a question from uh, Tanushri, another specialization student, to Linda Marchand. How do you actually define play, especially as it relates to other species whose motivations we cannot actually know? Perhaps it is in contrast to instrumental actions that <clears throat> clearly have some obvious goal. In other words, is something considered play if we as observers cannot determine any other reason for why the animals are doing those actions? Ooh. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, you can define play from a, an ethological point of view, looking at the behavior of the organism. So some of those cues that I pointed to in the talk, whether it's open mouth or whether it's um, exaggerated action or whether the pattern is repeated. But I also said in my talk that context is critical. Um, Sometimes you recognize play not only by the individual, but if it's, if, it's, if it's solitary play, then you can look for certain markers. If it's social, you have to kind of parse out, oh, is that play or is that aggression? So sometimes you're watching both individuals in, the, in a dyad. Are they doing something called self-handicapping? Are they turn-taking? And of course, I'm talking mostly here about primates, there's lots of cues in mammals, uh, but it turns out there's a beautiful literature that's kind of emerging on bird play, in particular taxa, the kia from New Zealand, um, ravens in Europe. And there you have to kind of know the ethology of the species and then say, wow, that's very exceptional. Or it looks like this animal is making choices um, in terms of motor patterns that have no... Um, purpose, if we think about their sort of general repertoire, why are they doing it? And especially this repertoire thing, or when animals start interacting with objects. So, and I think um, Tetsuro Matsuzawa could speak to this beautifully. Um, there's so much about ape, um, and particularly genus Pan, and particularly Pan troglodytes, acquiring patterns of behavior that are gonna be useful later in life, but in, then in fact, are framed by play when they're when they're infants and juveniles. Now I know there was more to that question, but I've I've lost the, the end of the the end of it. Pascal, could you give me more back? Give me some of it back, please. It's the limitation of 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 you having an operational definition. If you essentially can't chalk it up to some adaptive function or survival function, then does that make it play? Ah, but see, I, I made the argument, at least I hope I made the argument yeah. that I think in fact play is critically adaptive to, to how um, organisms become intact adult human beings. Uh, there's a lot of literature that shows whether it's rodents or um, human beings or um, mammals and lots of other taxa, that if they don't get to play in what looks like useless behavior, um, but it's not useless, um, they're actually going to be handicapped, severely handicapped in terms of their capacity to be competitive adults. So um, yeah, people say play is practice. Well, yes, it is. It's a whole lot more than that. And in fact, what, when I'm working, this goes back to Ian and, and the MOCA entries, when I'm working in, for, for you folks who are listening to this um, webinar, um, we're, we're working on these entries for, for the the, the MOCA publications, and you really have to kind of frame these, these um, topics that we're dis discussing and say, how is that either uniquely, maybe specifically an attribute of Homo or, or some, some hom 
part of hominin evolution, or is it something that's part of a shared lineage? And then for something like when I'm working on symbolic play, how it might be tied to childhood, Barry, <laughs> how it might be tied to language, Robert, um, and in fact, maybe symbolic play is something that is bootstrapped on what looks like simpler forms of play in other animals. So gone on a bit, but I hope that helps. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Alyssa. Well, can I uh, add since Please. Um, Linda mentioned childhood? Yes. Some, year, some years ago, 2002, I wrote a, uh, an article about childhood play and human growth. Um, I only looked at physical activity play, not at symbolic play, mm -hmm. to, so that I could put it in a uh, cross-species context. During human childhood, that is from about age three till about age 6.9 years, uh, physical activity play peaks in human beings. And uh, there are a lot of correlates of what's going on there, including a tremendously active period of brain reorganization and the, form, the formation of new connections between neurons, uh, synaptogenesis, but also the death, probably the programmed death of many, many neurons uh, that probably interacts with human cultural behavior and mm -hmm. language and nutrition and many other things in order to shape brains of children to be best suited for their local ecology, both the physical ecology and the cultural ecology. Yeah, and, and to complete this circle, as I write this entry, things that I'm thinking about um, is the issue of the, the emergence of childhood, but also cooperative rearing. I, I think that's gonna, yeah, exactly. And going back to Margaret, that you're gonna change a diet. You're gonna change the diet enough that you can grow the kind of brain, and this goes to Todd, um, that sets us apart from, from apes. So I think there's a lot of synergy going on there in terms of this organism that's developing at a particular point in its life history that does not look like an ape. If I can jump in here, um, I just wanted to get back to the, the, the pass off that Kristen gave me earlier that I kind of passed on. Um, <laughs> I think it's also important to understand that um, the brain is basically wiring itself around the experience that the child is exposed to. And this is particularly true of language. And so my colleague, Rachel Mayberry, um, has done a lot of work with uh, deaf individuals who are not exposed to sign language from birth. These are profoundly deaf people who do not do well with reading lips and, um, and vocalizing. Um, and not being exposed to language early in childhood has long-term, lifelong consequences. So eventually these people um, do find their way into the deaf uh, uh, educational system and they do learn sign language. Um, but many studies have shown that people who have been using sign language for 30 to 50 years, if they were not exposed to um, sign language early in childhood, they simply, they're not native and their brains are wired quite differently and they process language very differently. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, and this is an important thing, I think that as linguists, we need to get out there into the general public is that it's not just a question of language or no language, but also how much language. And so um, I was thinking, you know, when we were talking about the, the COVID restrictions, one of the possible upsides, at least for people who have young children, might be that maybe if you're not on Zoom the whole time, you might actually be talking to your kids more um, because there have been a lot of studies done um, with uh, lower socioeconomic um, status families and it, kids in those families get 50% less language input during formative years of early childhood um, than higher socioeconomic status um, families. And this again has long-term consequences on children's cognitive ability, how well they do in school and that carries over into um, you know, life choices and careers and all of that stuff and, and income earning ability. So exposure to language is extremely important, not just in a social sense, but in a neural sense, because the brain literally wires itself around that input. And so aside from the social deprivation that um, kids in the Romanian orphanages are subjected to, um, there's also severe lack of neural development in terms of, of language input. So. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and I don't, I mean, maybe this is a mistake because I don't know how, how time works here, but I, I, so I think this social appetite that, that goes with our life history that we get carries over to Ani. So I'm going to trust this to you because I think this thing about being connected is, is very much a part of what you're looking at. And the pleasure we get out of doing those musical things together is, um, very likely a thing that is a part of that lifelong appetite for being on the same page. Yeah, I, I think uh, this also resonates with something I, I heard in Tetsuro's talk about intrinsic motivation. So he talked about how uh, infants uh, who watch their, who are not explicitly taught the infant chimpanzees, they, they watch and then they're intrinsically motivated to try it themselves without any kind of reward. And we see this, uh, of course, with language children are desperate to communicate from a very young age, uh, linguistically, but also with music. And kids are, you know, really attracted to music. They don't need to be uh, bribed to uh, engage with music. Um, the way music develops, you know, I, I mentioned reading as a cultural invention that does not, uh, you know, we didn't evolve to read, um, but reading has to be effortfully taught. And it, you know, it's a long and arduous and, and often difficult process. Um, kids just sponge into music they, the way they sort of seem to to language as well. They, they seek it out, they want to interact with it, they love interacting socially uh, through music, and it seems to bring them uh, together. And they have, there are all kinds of social psychology studies about how um, they like people more after they've inter interacted with them musically and so forth. Um, so yeah, I think there's something important here about music as a different way of connecting human minds than language, a complementary way um, of connecting human minds. Um, so you, know, you could sort of think of them as potentially complementary ways of connecting our, our minds to each other. Thanks very much. But can, I, can I follow that up of from course. Of course. Um, Annie? Um, that I have speculated that if you're going to uh, get human type music, you probably need to find something musical in early hominin activities, rather like the person who wanted the running thing to work. And my speculation was that there, are, there is one context in which two fundamental aspects of music are important, and that is napping stone. That napping stone requires a certain amount of um, attention to pitch, um, that when a flake is removed, the pitch is very different from the time when the stone is hit by another stone um, and that the uh, removal of flakes very often occurs better when nappers are being rhythmical. And so rhythm and pitch might occur through napping stone. Um, and then all you need is for kids to be paying attention to that. Um, and there was another point, and I can't remember what it is, but it, it, it follows more or less from that. That's probably a good place to start anyway. Oh, sorry, the, the, the second thing was with Robert Plunder's point, using the um, Hockett criteria, that one of the interesting things about uh, music is that it has arbitrariness, certainly. It doesn't seem to have productivity in the sense that you will always sing Happy, J Happy Birthday, or you will always sing... Um, rockabye baby, but you will not notice that it sounds almost exactly the same as some other children's nursery, nursery rhymes. Um, and it's, I do, but the other children don't. Um, and, and so the, the Hockett criteria don't apply to music in the same way as the other things. And so what you've got is a system of arbitrariness without the symbolic context. Hockett was actually a musician, was very interested in music, never published that much on it, but uh, there are some writings where he talks about music, so it might, might be fun to discuss those who, later. Who was that? Hockett. Who? Hockett, Charles. right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Alisa, do you have the next question or? I do, and this question is for you, Tetsuro. This is from um, one of our Carter graduate students. What do you believe is or are the most important um, difference or differences in human cognition compared to that of the chimpanzee that allow humans to be such masterful teachers? Thank you. Um, the shortest answer, only one word, is imagination. Imagination. That is really, really makes us human. Um, the pitted against the uh, 
super working memory of chimpanzees. So I, I, this is my favorite stuff. I showed you chimpanzee has an extraordinary working memory, but we, we do not have it. Uh, but uh, we have language, symbolic play, whatever it is, understanding others' mind, are uh, always based on the power of imagination. Imagination is thinking of the things that is somehow different from seeing the things in front of you. Mm -hmm. So like there are a lots of examples and evidences in the psychology or cognitive science of uh, studying great apes. But I think imagination is really the shortest answer to the difference between humans and other creatures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have about a little bit over 10 minutes left before we need to wrap up. Uh, we have a few more questions and the next one is for, for Alyssa. Uh, and it's from Arpi asking, don't some non-human primates do allomothering? For example, baboons who take care of other mother's children in their unit? The, the short answer is yes, other non-human primates do in fact engage in what we consider to be cooperative care or allopaternal care. So you have really, um, you have some wonderful examples of small bodied neotropical primates. So the calotrichids, tam uh, tamarins and marmosets who do this. There has been some really interesting recent work um, being done of even some chimpanzees in the wild where you actually see some um, allo parental care, some allo maternal care. And interestingly, you find these chimpanzees, these chimpanzee moms, um, they, they actually end up weaning these chimps um, sooner, earlier. Now, there's not a lot of evidence of this. Um, it's not a robust literature. When you look at primates in general, you really see cooperative breeding or cooperative care in humans, in human great apes, and in these calotrichids. Otherwise, you see, you do see it, um, but it's not to the same to the same extent that you see it in human beings. And what you do see in humans is that you see it everywhere, across all societies, across all subsistence regimes, across all ecosystems. One of the characteristics of our reproductive system is that we have this reliance on distributed care. So while you might see this type of behavior, um, it, is, it is different uh, than what you do see in humans. I think Thank I saw much. somebody Tetsuro. raise their hand. Yes. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, in my last Q&A, uh, I, I, I think I said too short uh, imagination, but why we humans evolved and I think another shortest uh, way of explaining it is sharing. In my talk, I, I talked about sharing. So based on the imagination, um, humans and chimpanzee can understand others' mind. But the major difference is we share, spontaneously sharing. So sharing information, experience with others. So helps, helping the others, that is really the basic uh, cognitive function of humans. So just I wanted to add that point, sharing based on the imagination. Thank you. Um, can I, I just wanted to add on to something else. It reminded me, Alyssa and, and Pascal, in that uh, much like you're talking about, you see these examples of alloparenting in non-human primates. But in terms of the broad span of behavior, you only see it commonly across humans. And it strikes me it's a lot the same as meat eating. You get meat eating. We know that Shirley Strom's baboons exhibited meat eating. And as soon as those males went away, it went away. We know that Craig Stanford has meat eating in chimpanzees. We know that. But when you look across chimpanzees in general, you do not see that. Whereas across all human groups, except where you see population increasing to the point that you no longer can support meat eating, as in places like India, where you do not get much meat eating. And there are other places in China where you don't get much meat eating. But 
across with that with those exceptions meat eating is part of being human and it's not part of being other non-human primates with the exception of very small insectivorous primates if I can just add one more word on aloe mothering, the uh, aloe mothering is, is very common in, in old world monkeys, especially in colobene monkeys uh, and in baboons and colobene monkeys, aloe mothering is basically a, a way of, of getting a behavioral favor. I mean, trading of infants and caring of infants a dominant female will allow her infant to be cared for almost uh, by way of a trading a social commodity. This is not really care for the infant so much as a, a dominant female often allows her infant to be cared for by her sister or a relative. Uh, and that is a favor. It's like the animal is grooming, uh, the two females are grooming one another. So it's not, the infant doesn't really get a lot of, of extra protection or nutrition. The infant is used basically as a, as to some extent, a, a touch object and as a social commodity in a, in a trade. Could I follow up on that? Um, sometimes that, that, social commodity or trade in fact is neither because a dominant female may take a subordinate female's infant yeah. and aloe mother it to death is I think the way <laughs> described it. It's like, oh, that's a way to think about caring and sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so aloe mothering or aloe parental behavior can let younger males and females and it, it Barbary macaques They've got to be able to handle infants because they use them as political pawns and commodities. But we, we describe it collectively as alloparental behavior. But I think it's quite different than the way that Margaret was talking about or that Alyssa, the, the focus of Alyssa's paper is about. I mean, again, maybe there's this capacity, but what, what we do as humans is take it a different different direction and kind of ratchet it up. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, even though my area <laughs> of research has nothing to do with any of this, but no. that's kind of the same point that I was trying to make in my talk is that you can find instances of these kinds of human-like behaviors right. in the animal kingdom and also in apes, but it's, it's, it's just really incipient. It's just, you know, there's like a resemblance, um, but it's, it, again, as, as Margaret said, I think you repeated, Linda, it's humans just take these features and just really run with them and amplify them to the max. Um, so it, maybe, that's, maybe that's the answer to the human ape paradox in general. Well, or or we, we redesign them. We kind of redirect them. Hmm. You know, they, they look different in terms of their evolutionary consequences. So I think human alloparental behavior is not like what we're seeing um, in some non-human primates. Although the calotrichids are pretty wonderful, um, but that's another story. They are, and that's a different story. And I think I think one of the take home messages and something that Margaret's point um, kind of led me to want to reiterate is that we have to think about the consequences of this type of reproductive system on the mom. So the consequences of this type of investment on the evolution of the female reproductive system in general. And so we can see those effects and they are categorically different than the impacts of that type of care, if we wanna call it that, if we're using an infant as a social tool um, in terms of non-human primates, but it is very different. So the nature and scope is very different. So to mm -hmm. Margaret's point. Lisa, you wanna ask the, the final question and then we wrap up? Oh my goodness, the final question. Okay, <laughs> wow. All right. Um, well, Margaret, you're in the hot seat because my final question is for you. Um, so in your, this is from Megan, one of our students. Um, in your research, you've documented great flexibility in food sources of various hominin species based on ecological variation. So do you think as different groups of hominins had these unique niches that they were adapted to, that there was subsequent divergent evolution in these species in favor of specific diets that they were adapted to? Yes. <laughs> A very short answer. And I think of it specifically with the paranthropines in East Africa. 
those animals have very different diets. And so every time I think of them as a human relative, I wanna go, whoa, not very close they aren't, or at least not mine. They are really different and it's a dietary separation. So that doesn't answer your question with any specificity, but yes, I do think it had to do with differences in diets. And, and some of those we can't pick up by bone chemistry. It's just that we're getting a bit of a hint through the bone chemistry. Uh, so I think if we think in a sophisticated way about bone chemistry, without having it be, um, without looking at averages, let's look at an average, okay, but we need to look at the spread around that average and the distribution and how the distribution is around that average and, and how different those diets are. Absolutely. I'm so glad that diet question was at the end because I tell you, diet, <laughs> without it, we wouldn't be here, guys. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I'd like to, uh, to wrap this up by, by thanking all of you so much for this incredible lineup of presentation and thank the audience as well. And, Tune, tune back in. We will, we will have a future Carter Symposia. You can look them up on the web page and sign in as a user. Then you actually get an announcement about future meetings. Thank you all so much uh, for your contributions. And thanks to the audience uh, who is totally virtual this time. And of course, there's a big team of people that are not visible that have made this possible. Uh, it went without a glitch. And I, I want to thank our entire team, UCTV and the Carter staff. So take care, stay safe, uh, use your masks as you step out, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.